Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle D'Amico, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs, or CGA. Since its founding, our goal at CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through our two graduate programs, one in global affairs and another MS in global security, conflict and cybercrime. We also offer a wide variety of skills and knowledge-based continuing education courses and offer public events such as this that expand upon the topics covered in our classrooms. We are very proud to be home to the George H. Heyman Program for Philanthropy and Fundraising. Through our open enrollment courses and certificate in fundraising program, we offer professionally oriented educational options for those looking to enter or grow within the fundraising field. Courses are taught by practitioner faculty who bring their vast experience, expertise, and networks to the classroom. We'll send a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have. We've also reserved some time at the end of today's event for questions from the audience, so please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A tool. And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Bianca Durney, president and founder of Aperio Philanthropy, our event partners on this series. The virtual floor is all yours, Bianca. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for being here today. We're really looking forward to the conversation. As Michelle said, I'm Bianca Durani, president and founder of Aperio Philanthropy. Aperio is a fundraising consulting firm that specializes in working alongside nonprofits to generate sustainable, predictable revenue growth. I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for today, Aperio's own Laura Safran. Laura is managing director of client services, and in her role, she works with nonprofits large and small across the country on their fundraising strategies, capacity building, and donor engagement. Prior to joining Aperio, Laura was Director of Individual Giving at City Harvest here in New York. And in that role, she worked closely with the Board of Directors on philanthropy, both their own personal investment in the mission of City Harvest and their engagement of their networks, their friends, their family in the important work. We're delighted to have her here today with three other panelists that she'll introduce momentarily. The four of them will have a conversation for about 45 minutes and then as Michelle said, we'll open it up to Q&A. So start dropping your questions in the chat along the way as you go, and we'll get to as many as we can in the end. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Laura. Thanks, Bianca. I'm thrilled to be here today. Again, I'm Laura Safran. I'm the Managing Director at Aperio Philanthropy, and will be your facilitator for the afternoon. Our topic today is how to engage your board in your fundraising vision. This year, nonprofits um, have really endured the crisis more than ever and are thinking boldly about their role in the world and the impact that they wanna make. This process of reimagining is critical because the needs in our community are really critical. Today's discussion is gonna focus on topics such as what we're learning about the potential for collaboration between the nonprofits board members and what causes they are serving. We're gonna talk about finding limits within your organization and creating the foundation to build from and applauding your successes and realizing your pitfalls. We have three fantastic panelists here today to share their experience and insights. Colleen Crino is our Chief Development Officer at Creating IT Futures, where she leads the planning and implementation of strategies to develop revenue streams that support the continued growth of the organization. Colleen has extensive experience designing fundraising, marketing, and loyalty strategy in both nonprofit and the corporate worlds. Janine Kihihe is the Chief Advancement Officer for Communities and Schools. In her role, Janine oversees the fundraising, marketing, and communications and new business development functions within the organization. Janine has 15, over 15 years of experience in nonprofit development and executive leadership with a really successful track record for designing and implementing fundraising strategies. And last but not least, we have Mariana Tu, who's our Chief Executive Officer at America Needs You, where she oversees the strategy and direction to ensure excellence and accountability within the organization. Mariana's experience lends its hand to rallying stakeholders, board members, partners, and donors to create progress and lasting results. So thanks everyone again for joining us and thanks to the panelists. To get the conversation started, I'd like to ground our conversation in hearing about each of the panelists' experiences during the past year. How was your organization specifically affected and what did you learn about your purpose? Let's start with Colleen. Great, thank you so much, Laura. 
Um, so my organization, Creating IT Futures, is an educational nonprofit, and we're focused on providing workshops and classes for youth and adults uh, in tech topics to help them get into tech careers, particularly those who are not in tech already. And so when COVID hit, like everyone else, we had to pivot to online learning, and many of you are probably in that same boat. Um, what we started to see in the wake of that change was how differently the impact happened for our adult students versus our youth students. So in our tech girls middle school classes, we saw a huge boom in demand as schools had a really hard time getting their programming up and running quickly, particularly when it came to STEM programming. Uh, so we saw this just tremendous demand for, uh, for this online programming. For our adult programming, on the other hand, it was much more challenging for adults to try to carve out time for classwork when they had childcare responsibilities and unpredictable work schedules or situations and kids pulling on their legs. Um, and so we really had to adapt and we're continuing to adapt to the needs of the different students, which are so much different than they were sort of pre-COVID. One thing that did feel incredibly good throughout the crisis though, was that our mission felt centered in what was needed most. While we don't provide, you know, kind of food or, um, you know, kind of those types of services, um, that support for good education and the pathway to good, stable, and family supporting careers is so crucial, particularly for many who were being most impacted by the crisis, particularly women and people of color. Um, and so I think for myself and my team, we began to see our role as more critical than ever and felt that that long-term path for individuals to career success and getting out of jobs that are at a high risk of automation is so crucial for our audiences in the long term. And honestly, it makes me and I think the rest of our team all just hop out of bed that much more quickly in the morning, knowing um, that the mission is that much more relevant right now. Thanks, Colleen. Janine? So the core of our model at Community School is to ensure that all students have the support and resources needed to succeed. So that includes both the basic needs such as access to food, shelter, but also ensuring that their social and emotional needs are met. So that support has not changed, but deepened during the past year. However, at Community School by nature of our name has always existed inside of school. So that looked very different during a virtual environment. So what has changed specifically is that we had to show up where our students were at. Instead of inside of a classroom, our national network of connected, connected with families on doorsteps and stairwells, in parking lots of food banks and shelters. Um, so that's how our, our programmatic um, effort evolved. And with regards to your other half of your question, I would say it's really similar to what Colleen just said, in that what we've learned about our purpose is that is that rather than it just really affirmed um, why we exist in the first place. So the disparities in our education system. Um, they're not new, but they have been exacerbated um, in the past year as a result of the inequities that we've seen. And in a new virtual learning environment, more affluent families have had access to learning pods. They have access to homeschooling and private schools. And that was not an option for all of our students. And so we remain more committed than ever to ensure equitable conditions for learning for all of our students. So it definitely, I would say for sure, deepened um, our connection with our purpose and our mission and, and really just fuel us to be able to continue um, to continue to march forward. Thank you. Mariana? Sure. Well, first of all, nice to meet everyone. Thank you all for having me. Um, and just for a little bit of background, America Needs You is a career development and mentoring program that works exclusively with first generation college students when they are undergrads. So like Janine and Colleen, we did have that pivot to virtual learning. And I think one of the, the pieces that did connect us to our purpose, though, is we said, you know, if we can't do things in the normal way, what is the real core driver of impact in our program? And we believe that that was the mentoring relationship. So I think when we designed the virtual program, we knew we couldn't completely replicate what we were doing, but there are also some advantages. For example, it's always been hard to recruit clinical healthcare mentors based on weekend work schedules because we have Saturday programming. But for the first time we were able to have more, you know, physicians, nurses, clinical healthcare workers, despite being through COVID, they were also volunteering as mentors in higher numbers than before. So I think seeing that there's mentoring potential and that the mentoring relationship is an anchor in a time of chaos was very motivating for us. Um, I think the other piece, which has also been touched on, is that emergency funding and the fact that regard our, our goal is to get students to graduate and enter, you know, leadership track careers. However, 
We know people can't do that if you're dealing with health issues, food insecurity, and we definitely focused on that emergency funding. Um, and then I think finally, uh, we did, of course, we're going to talk a lot about fundraising. We saw huge changes to the way we engage people, run special events, and talk about our mission. And again, hugely challenging to say most of our money comes from a gala or from a spring party or from a cocktail event. But I think the thing that was interesting is because we're an organization headquartered in New York, but working across four different states, it actually allowed us to do some more collaborative fundraising. So for example, our New York-based gala, our Chicago site and board raised more money than they ever had, even though the event overall went down a little bit. So I think that that kind of helped us feel more like the work that we're doing in all of our sites is truly part of this national movement for economic mm -hmm. mobility, for investing in career development. Um, and I know we'll talk about this later, but I think that the employer side of things is really interesting right now. And I think that all of us in the nonprofit sector have the ability to, to sort of elevate student voices at this time and really think about not changing students, but changing the environments they are entering. Um, and this year has been very, um, very unique for that. Talking about racial equity and talking about specifically in terms of talent pipelines and inclusion at work is I think mm -hmm. where, where ANY kind of sees our purpose fitting in. Thanks, Mariana. You alluded to collaboration across regions and collaboration across teams and thinking differently. I wanna bring us back to the board and hear from all of you, what role did your board play in navigating the crisis last year? And what, what role are they playing now as you think about next, what's next? Jean, I'll start with you. Um, sure. So I just think that it's important to just really get real and honest about that, where the crisis in our education system preceded the pandemic. Um, so that, that's just um, real facts. And so as it's likely true for the inequities that your nonprofits are looking to, um, to offset while they were certainly exacerbated, they're, they're not new. Um, so at communities and schools specifically, we actually have engaged the board in different ways. So several years ago, we recognized that we had a responsibility to evolve from a charity mindset to a justice mindset. So it, it's really started by moving the board and all of our stakeholders along in their DEI journey. So we, we haven't arrived yet, to be clear. We're still, we're still in that process and on that journey. Um, everyone is at different places of, of that journey. And the reason this is important to note this is that we engage in our work differently and we were able to engage in our work differently um, during the past year as a result. So in our response to the pandemic and making sure that we were positioning ourselves programmatically to respond to the needs, but we were also able to quickly align and how not just through our actions, but also through our words, we're taking very um, public positions and the stances that we take in being able to talk about these inequities that impact the social and emotional well-being of our communities. So I would say that the work preceded the past year. And if the past year is really sparking the dialogue, making sure that you're doing it, not just because um, everyone else is doing it and you feel like you have to, but really just making sure that you're doing it from a very authentic place. So the fact that we had those conversations prior to the past years, uh, it made it a lot easier to be able to continue those conversations um, when we were um, in, in a collective crisis moment, but the crisis again have certainly preceded the pandemic. So the alignment and the vision is important. It makes it easier to talk the talk, you know, and, and walk the talk when, and also to be able to then pair that with what are the investments needed to advance that work forward? Because it, there are investments that are needed um, and, and we have to make sure that we're comfortable talking about those numbers as well. Thanks. Mariana, tell us a little bit about how you partnered with your board over the last year and what are they doing now? Sure. Um, well, I think, I think Janine's point about, you know, what the dynamic was with your board before and in in, in being engaged in your mission and then after is so critical because what I'd say is this past year, we've had really high engagement from our board. And I think our board has been, you know, maybe more engaged than they ever have been because we are in a crisis situation. We are making so many decisions very quickly. And I think actually the question is how do we sustain that beyond? So in the past year, I'd say first thing, our board was highly focused on financial health, liquidity. We had a special liquidity committee. I'm sure like many of you, we had a lot of meetings and a lot of check-ins about you know what we thought things might look like. Do we have healthy operating reserves? All of that. So there was a lot of focus on that and then focus on um, things like pivoting our gala to a virtual gala. So I think our, our board was very important in helping look at the revenue and financial landscape. I think um, right now, and as, as the organization is moving forward, a couple of things that have been helpful are some of the internal operational 
decisions we're making are the same ones everyone is making in every company across every industry, like how we might return to work. Um, Jean, you mentioned things like um, what public statements you put out as an organization. There are so many things happening in the world every single day and week. And I think talking with our teams and our staff members about you know, what are external voices? What is fatiguing for our staff members? What is important and valuable for, for our staff members and our mission has been you know, hard to navigate. And I think really important to not get right, but to keep learning from and to, doing the best, to, to do the best that we can. So I think things like looking at um, open, reopening office work plans, communications plans, um, getting guidance from board members on like as a leader in an organization, like where to put my time and attention. I think that has been something that my board members can really relate to because they are dealing with the exact same thing. So they've shared kind of the specific documents, plans, the way their teams are even checking in with each other through this and shifting. Um, and then I think finally, right now, I think the board's helping us say, great, we were just internally focused, trying to get through this last year. Let's really take a step back now and look, look at the world around us and make sure that we're also beginning to think again about our future even though it's not the right time to write a five-year strategic plan, let's really look at those six month sprints and do some longer term planning. Thanks, Mariana. Colleen, talk to us a little bit about your board looking back the year. What, what are they working on today? How are they being helpful? Yeah, so, so our board members, I would say definitely, you know, similar to Mariana and Janine, they played a consultative role for the business as we were making our pivots. But they too had a number of business related issues to manage in their own businesses. So I think they, like the rest of us, founded a balancing act, figuring out how to best juggle family, work, and their board responsibilities. Um, so I don't know that, I don't think we necessarily pushed them as much as maybe we could have specific to fundraising because we were all sensitive to how the day to day challenges were impacting everyone. But I found similar success to what. Um, Mariana was mentioning about really tapping into them for their business expertise on a lot of the issues that we were facing at the time from a leadership perspective uh, with respect to the team and really thinking about what, was, what were the ways that we would need to pivot to move forward. And they definitely stepped forward to have several discussions with us about how the pivot was impacting our business, how they could help think through it with us. And I actually approached one board member in particular who just is a very strategic and thoughtful leader um, to discuss with me how important the role of parents is to our youth students. So this is something that we had been seeing, you know, kind of to Janine's point prior to uh, the crisis, but it really started to become more evident during COVID. And this particular board member helped me to map out a new concept for how we could support parents even more in the journey of their children particularly in a virtual environment where parents may be even more out of the loop of what their middle and high school students are learning, but the parents are still such an important influence in their lives. So this board member not only kind of sat down with me and helped me really think through this concept and how to map it out, but then brought his organization to the table and they're now funding this new concept that we're now beginning to build. Um, so, you know, I think it was all about really respecting the place that the board members were just like the rest of us in a very, you know, kind of crisis mode, both personally and with their businesses and thinking about, you know, how they could use that experience to, uh, to best help inform our work. And I think that's where we saw the best success. A great segue into talking about really what's their role in philanthropy overall, right? We we often see that boards are serve, um, serving as that consultant type of role to give strategic guidance, really helps make some of those really important business decisions as you've all alluded to. But let's talk about fundraising. What do you view as the, ro the role of the board in fundraising today? And what does that really look like at its best? Mariana, I'd love to hear your opinion here. Sure. Um, well, I think the role of the board is to give, to be donors, to make introductions and to attend meetings, right? I think the question is, how do we, how do we kind of get there, right? And <laughs> what does it look like at its best? What I would say is, I think there are um, many times, or I've struggled with this as well, where we talk about board members' roles in individual conversations one-on-one -on -one with board members, and then we have meetings that are just kind of like updates for everyone. And it's always individual follow-up. Individual follow-up is key, but I think at its best, 
board fundraising looks like board members beginning to collectively see where they may have overlapping relationships and start to drive that forward together. And I think, of course, as much as possible, effective board fundraising means that your board meetings, when you're talking about revenue, when you're passing the budget, and when you're talking about fundraising strategy, board members are presenting those. And you know, if I don't speak at all in a board meeting, that means it was a home run board meeting. <laughs> and if our board chair is talking with other board members about their giving, that's a home run. If it, it doesn't happen immediately or it doesn't happen overnight or with every board member, I think even just doing it a little bit more collectively, right? That I and my board chair together are talking with other board members about their strategy can make a big difference. Um, and the last thing I'd say is that I think the board's other role is to actually get sometimes information that we can't as outsiders, especially if we're thinking about corporate giving. Because for example, we had um, a corporation we've had a lot of programmatic engagement with but not gotten any funding. So we've met with them several times about, you know, what it would look like and we hear one thing and then we talk to some board members and they're like, yeah, you just need a board member or you don't get money from that organization. We're like, oh, they're like, yes, they, their strategy is to put senior leaders on boards and those are the only people they fund, they don't fund other people. But there's no way for us to know that without board members telling us that and also helping us navigate how the internal departments may work together or not work together in a large corporation um, and what really are the levers uh, for philanthropy in particular. Thanks, Mariana. Colleen, your board is a quite an interesting structure, as I learned earlier this week. And I, I know we spoke about using your board members as advocates and bringing ideas back. Talk to the group a little bit about how you are currently using your board in fundraising and what would be um, your vision to improve that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think just like fundraising has so many different elements and supporting tools, so too does a board have a number of different talents and capabilities to support fundraising. So in particular, I have a very small full-time fundraising team. So using the different talents of my board members to supplement the work of my team has been really helpful. And I'll give you a few more examples. I shared the one just a moment ago, but I have one board member who's an incredibly strong communicator and she is very excited to spread mission messaging wherever she can. And I've been able to tap into that because she's happy to sit on panels. She's happy to give talks. She will even do TV interviews about her work on the board and the mission of our organization and how important it is to support it. So I love tapping into her passion for messaging and then following up with her work to identify contacts who are excited about her message or people that she's met at these different conferences that she's speaking at um, in order to identify fundraising prospects. So that's been just a huge value for me because she's out there in a lot of places where I'm not going to be or people are my team are not going to be and she can kind of, uh, you know, sort of seed our message all over the place. And then I have another few board members who are very different. They, they're not, you know, sort of out in the public eye, but they've been really interested in getting more personally engaged in our business and understanding their business, understanding our business and wanting their companies or their corporations to both donate and volunteer. Um, so working with them on identifying how their companies can become engaged on multiple fronts helps them feel really invested in their ability to create support for our organization. So almost drawing up a strategy roadmap for their organization um, and letting them kind of lead, lead the charge on that makes them feel like their value is so unique and it is. Um, and then lastly, I have another board member whose favorite thing to do is to play matchmaker uh, for me with other organizations and individuals that he knows. Uh, and that's just like who he is. And he loves this both for fundraising and for strategy. And I have to be open to the fact that, you know, some of the people that he's introducing me to are exactly the people that I would want to talk to. And some of them, you know, are interesting conversations that may not lead um, that much farther, but I get such huge value from these, these introductions and I love tapping into his enthusiasm for that matchmaking role to help me engage with these organizations and people that I wouldn't otherwise, many of them I wouldn't have even had on my radar. He's in a different geography than I am, but he has been able to introduce me to some, to some really fabulous um, people and organizations that, um, that he can see align very well. And I've, I've just had some, uh, some really great success with that. So I, I feel like it's really for me, it's been about, you know, just as I would manage my full-time team, um, you know, managing my board team it, it is very similar. It's sort of, okay, what talents do you bring to the table? Where can you help me? Um, where can you complement the work that I'm already doing? 
Um, and, you know, as opposed to me just handing, you know, handing them um, an ask, I try to really be thoughtful about, okay, you guys are bringing different kinds of talents um, to the table. How can, um, how can we work together in that way? Thanks, Colleen. Janine, I want to hear a little bit more from you about the board's role. And specifically, we talked earlier this week about recruitment and what the recruitment process, um, how that plays, the board recruitment process plays into their role in fundraising and communicating some of those requirements up front. Sure. So I think that what Colleen and Marianne have sort of described is really what you should aspire to have your board dynamics look like. But I also, I also have had a lot of conversations with peers in the sector, and, and that's not quite what their board makeup looks like. So I, I kind of want to speak to that audience. And so it really starts really at, at the recruitment phase where you really need to have clarity and understanding um, what you're looking for. Um, what currently is a, is a gap in your bo board um, dynamics and your board matrix. So doing an assessment, taking a step back. And if you need fundraisers, then you need to make sure that you're communicating that as you're recruiting for board members. Um, and then, you know, once you've identified a board member who is really engaged with your mission and also has capacity to support with, with fundraising, making sure that they're also properly onboarded as well, because I've seen a lot of misses on that as well, where there's really strong board members who have, have, have strong financial capacity to give, have strong network. And once they come on, you just kind of expect them to sort of just show up and they don't. And then when they don't, you're sort of disappointed. So really the, the onboarding is really important to make sure that they understand not just their role, their fiduciary responsibility, but also how do they talk about your, your mission? How do they um, engage? What are the different opportunities for them to be able to invite friends, um, whether that's virtual events right now or other, have conversations with someone on program. So these are all things important are important to really um, recognize. So it's really making sure that they're part of a journey and that you're having those touch points so that way you can aspire to be um, you know, in an organization where the board is acting in the way that Colleen and, and Mariana have described, because you, you have to make sure that you start to take the steps if you're not quite there. And another um, sort of thing that I want to also call out, because I actually have seen this as well in quite a few organizations, is just seeing um, our the board as sort of um, the, the people we tap into when we're in financial crisis. And, and that's also really harmful. So I just wanna call that out in that if you're not building these relationships, if you're not really having engagement with your mission, um, it's, it's, that, that has a, a lifespan, right? That may, that may work for you in, in a few moments, but over time, you're going to disengage your board. And it, it really has long-term sort of um, casualties, unfortunately, with regards to their engagement. So it's really important to make sure that you're engaging them in relationships, you're bringing along the journey, you're connecting them with the mission, um, and that does start at the beginning. And if, if you're not actively recruiting board members, then you need to take a step back and just sort of do an assessment of your current board dynamics and really think about where do you want to see them and what are the steps you can take to sort of re-engage them and help them understand their, their role, um, their fiduciary role and all other roles that they have on their board as well. I think that's such a great point. We, in our role as um, consultants for the nonprofit space, we so often hear from folks that their boards are checked out or that they aren't involved in fundraising, whether that's personally, philanthropically or helping through that fundraising process. But when we are digging in, we really find out is they're not being resourced properly. They're not being managed really like donors and advocates, as Janine is mentioning. So I want to talk a little bit about the staff role in all of this and how do we really, we've talked about the ideal, what it looks like to have boards involvement in fundraising, right? That's matchmaking, that strategy, it's ownership over pieces of that uh, process, bringing specific ideas and actually acting as fundraisers themselves and, and participating philanthropically personally, right? Marianne, I wanna hear about your role, right? What is this CEO's role in facilitating all of that? How to, how to maybe major gift officers that are listening in today, what is their role in making sure that we do help the board accomplish all of those things that we've been talking about? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think you see so much variety in these roles across different organizations um, and with different normally often inherited cultures over time of who talks to the board and who doesn't and how those dynamics work. So um, what we sort of said at AMI with all donors and including board members, we try to always, even in, in Salesforce, you have like a primary relationship manager and also a secondary relationship manager. We try to make sure that people don't only talk to one person, that our board members don't only talk to me and our donors don't only talk to me. Um, 
And I think this is important for other frontline fundraisers as well. Someone's out of the office. It's impossible to take a vacation if you're the only person who can talk to someone. And so I think that starting to build that culture, if you don't have it, by even saying like, let's talk about each other's portfolios together and ask questions about each other's portfolios, I think starts to change that a little bit. And then also starts to see um, the different approaches people have towards board management or towards donor ma management. So for example, you know, I gave the, the um, example of a corporate gift from a board member uh, or a corporation that you need a board seat for. So we'll have something like that happen. And then we'll have um, people say, great. So to get money from corporations, we always need to put someone on the board. It's like, no, that's not what we said. That happened once. So like, you know, let's talk about it with individual board members to see how their companies are different. Um, and so I think um, that's my first point, just that it shouldn't only be the CEO or the ED and um, happy to talk with people about strategies, you know, in the future, if you need to kind of make that journey. Um, I think the other thing that staff, the staff role in the board is, you know, again, like donors, people always say, if you want, um, if you want advice, ask for money. And if you want money, ask for advice, right? I think that it's, critical for staff members who are dealing with challenges day to day, especially in a year like this past one, to give board members context on what really is difficult. We're always talking about all of our wins so they can go sell the wins. People want to talk about what's changing. So for example, maybe community college enrollment has gone down in, in general in your state. Uh, maybe applications are up in one area and down in another. And this is why we think why, and this is how it's tied to something real, national, global, something that they're probably dealing with at their business, I think it's definitely the role of staff members to keep providing that social context for the work that really engages board members and also allows them to add value and talk about your mission in a way that's much more relatable than like, we are great, here are our great outcomes. We talk about ourselves all the time and we should really be talking about the same problems they're facing. This is how we see them playing out in, for example, college and economic mobility and graduation rates. Thanks, Mariana. You're getting to the point of working with board members, yes, as a group, but also we have to work with them each individually and find what works for them. So Colleen, I wanna hear a little bit about, I wanna dig into the, bit, the toughest piece of the puzzle here, right? Which is board giving and the philanthropic giving from the board members themselves. What difference do you think a board member's personal giving really makes, not just going beyond the get, not just fundraising on behalf of your organization? And then how are you approaching it? How are you talking yeah. to them about their personal giving? No, I think that's, a, it's a really good question overall. And I think, you know, you had touched on a little bit on kind of the unusual nature of, of our board. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that just to give context. So, uh, so I'm part of the nonprofit Creating IT Futures. That's the 501c3 part of our organization, we're actually a subsidiary of CompTIA, which is the industry association for the IT industry. And so our board is actually very interesting because they, they are specifically tasked with being a strategic board um, because the fiduciary responsibility for the uh, kind of for our organization in terms of um, uh, governance belongs to CompTIA. And so the CompTIA senior staff members are, are kind of the fiduciary element of our board, uh, as opposed to the strategic members um, that are the ones that I work with. And many of them predated me uh, being with the organization. So they were never really um, put in a, in a role where they needed to raise money at all. Uh, in fact, they were not told that they that any of their role related to funding, whether that was personal or um, or sort of influencing other organizations. And again, because they're, they they didn't have fiduciary decision making responsibility, still don't. So I really had to come in and approach the board from a totally different lens because they weren't there with any impression that they had to do any fundraising um, or give any money at all. And so, you know, essentially what I had to do was, was treat each one of them as I would treat an individual donor prospect from scratch, you know, kind of engaging them uh, to say, listen, you know, you, as much as I kind of described, like you are so critical to the strategy of what I'm doing as a fundraiser. Uh, and I, you know, I need your help. And I obviously I need any support that you can provide as well. But it, it, it's really been about cultivating each one of them as individual donors 
um, without having any sort of preconceived notion that they had to they had to meet a particular fundraising goal or that they had to do certain things because they came on board without any of that and um, and I think it, it honestly it took me probably a year or two <laughs> to to get them to that place of like oh okay we get it where our role is you know as part of a nonprofit board is to help with fundraising and to to give money um, but it was it was through cultivating them as individual donors that, um, that, that really, you know, I had to, had to kind of approach it from that way, treat them as individuals so that they understand that their participation and contribution is as important and even more important than my most valuable donors. Um, but I couldn't sort of lean on the fact that they had an expectation uh, that that already existed. Um, so I, I was kind of coming late to that party and having to to sort of engage them in that way. But but again, I think that that you know, kind of treating them as individual, just thinking about them as individual donors and strategic voices was um, you know, was the way that that um that helped me. I think somebody met, you know, asked me that question in the chat too. It's like, it's just um, you know, as you would with a new employee too, kind of asking a lot of questions, who they are, what what's exciting to them, what talent do they bring. Um, and then how they can both bring that as well as the, the support that you need. Uh, and and it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it definitely took me a year or two to, to get them onto that same page. I think that's such a good point, Colleen, not just treating them like individual donors, but often like a prospect, right? Starting from scratch, whether you're a new member of the team, a new leader, you've been there for a while and you're just reimagining the way to work with the board of really starting from scratch there, working with them individually, but also knowing it's not gonna change tomorrow, that this is a long-term solution of partnering with them as strategists, but also as individual fundraisers. So thank you for that point. Janine, I wanna hear a little bit from you and how you approach um, all of this. I know you, you alluded to not only going to your board members when you need it, when there's crisis and there's funding needed, not treating them like an ATM, which often happens with boards in crisis when you need that little boost of revenue. So talk to me a little bit about how, how you're working with your board members and working with them as, you know, for their personal philanthropy. Sure. So I think that there's a really uh, important um, term you use, which is treating them like a prospect. And I think that's actually right on. And I think that, you know, I've also seen um, many instances where a board member gives a significant donation um, for your organization. And the response is to say thank you, right, and be grateful and appreciative. However, um, really, as a prospect, if you know a prospect had a capacity to give a really sizable gift, let's just say a six or seven figure gift, and they're making a thousand dollar donation, um, you know, would you say thank you? Or would you take a step back and say, hey, how can we bring them up, right? You would probably do both, right? Obviously, you would be grateful, but then you also want to make sure that you're sort of assessing opportunities to deepen that engagement. So with board members, um, we need to make sure that we're seeing them and their role in the same sort of way. They're already on the board, right? So you, they're already engaged. They're already on the hook, right? How can you sort of bring them along um, closer to the mission, closer to the work, and making sure that if they're given whatever gift they're given, making sure that you're also strategizing behind the scenes, doing the work, doing the research to make sure that you're making um, you know, with your development team suggestions and recommendations on where we want to move the board as individuals. And it really helps to have the collective conversations that Mariana has been addressing before where you're saying, okay, as a board, you know, let's take stock of where we're at. This is where we're at as a collective. This is where we want to be. And this is the impact we want to see. And the impact is the programmatic aspect of this. So now you're really connecting those investments, those in, the increases in that with the actual programmatic outcomes. And that's why they're on the board. They want to see an impact. So being able to make sure that you're talking about the dollars, but connected with their impact is really the shift. And part of that is now making sure that you're also doing the work to be proactive and not reactive in how you want to position them. So now that you've gotten them excited about the impact, you've got them excited about the impact, you can say, oh, by the way, um, you know, I know you care about this specific aspect of our work so much. And by the way, would you consider? Now it makes it a lot easier to sort of continue those conversations. And, and I think also what's really important to um, know is, is really just the idea of board given just um, in broadly, how important it is to make sure that you have 100% board given on, you, on your board, because it's really hard 
to ask others in their network to support and invest in, the, in, in your work and your mission if they themselves have not bought in. You know, the join me is such a strong statement for board members to say to their network. So making sure that you're first deep in engagement with them, you're being really proactive and intentional in um, how you're, you're engaging with them, treating them the way you would a prospect. It, it will really help to um, see significant outcomes, both programmatically, but also um, um, with their engagement and also with, their, with the fundraising. I think that's such a really important point that we often forget is that board members, if we are asking them to fundraise on our behalf, they also need to give. And what give means to everyone is different, right? But that that call to action of join me, it, like Janine said, I think is so much stronger um, and really helps rally other donors around your cause and your programs. We've talked about what staff should do, some advice on how to ask board members for their own personal philanthropy. Before we move to Q&A, I wanna hear from each of you about what are people doing wrong? What is the number one mistake that leaders or fundraisers are making when they're engaging the board? And what alternative approach do you recommend? So let's start with Janine. Well, I would say the, <laughs> the biggest mistake is just not talking about it. Um, you know, there, there's, you know, I think it was Colleen who mentioned earlier, which is a very common reality the past year is sort of tiptoeing around the fundraising questions during a year where you know everyone is dealing with something. But the reality is that the richest people in the country have become richer, right? And meanwhile, we weren't talking to them because we were scared that perhaps they were dealing with things the way the rest of us were. So not talking about it, I think is the biggest mistake one can make. And we, we make assumptions, we make a lot of assumptions. And by building those relationships, you're making sure that your assumptions are baked in reality or not. And so I think that it's okay to be able to go and say, hey, how are you doing? And then if they're not doing okay, then you don't ask them for money because they're not doing okay. But don't make assumptions before you've had a conversation. So I think that just that's a, a really great example of showing how the richer got richer and we weren't talking to them because we were worried that they were dealing with stuff. So not talking about it, I would say is the biggest mistake. Ariana, I see you nodding along. What, what mistakes have you seen folks make or have you made that um, you have maybe an alternative solution to? Yeah, well, I totally agree. Number one is just not you know, asking board members for gifts, for example, because you're scared of it, or I don't know, for whatever reason, you haven't set that expectation. So I do think um, Janine also mentioned um, onboarding. So I think we talk a lot about, you know, figuring out the right size ask, making it at the right time. But I think an onboard, I mean, one of the first questions I always ask new board members is, so how do you think about your philanthropy? Like, what times of year do you normally give? Are there other things that you're involved in? Kind of, what is um, what is your process? What are your priorities? And how do you make those decisions in your family? And I think having that, then you can see again if it's changed. Um, and I think one thing we saw too is the peer mentorship of other board members. For example, one of our uh, board members had never set up a donor advised fund and wanted to look at doing that. So we talked to another board member who just been through that process. And all of a sudden they're really talking about giving together. And I think they're really adding value to each other in that way. So I'd say um, absolutely do that. And I think the second thing we always make a mistake with is you know, not being on the same page as staff members. And I think it's incredibly challenging, for example, if you're working with a CEO or an ED who you know, says different things to the board than you say you're gonna say, or the expectations aren't clear. So I mean, I really am a fan if you can get, get this part of your organizational culture of role-playing asks and meetings with donors and also with board members. And so I, I think that goes back to like discussing portfolios together as uh, collaborative thinkers around it. Like, what do you think is going on with this person? What's the context? What are we doing with other board members? And so I think the more you can kind of pre-align on those conversations, you're less likely to be in the situation. I've certainly been in this many times before where someone comes from a meeting and they're like, no, I you know, didn't ask, or I've never asked this person, or I don't like asking this person. Um, and I think that there is an opportunity to change it by starting the questioning piece and then planting the seed. So those would be my two ask and figure out how to get on the same page with expectations internally. Those are great. Colleen, what's, a, what's one of the mistakes that you've seen? Yeah, no, I love how, how do you avoid it? <laughs> I love everything that's been said. I'm taking, taking notes, things that I need to address too. Um, so I think on our team, it probably has been keeping the board on the, like early, particularly early on, keeping the board sort of in, in a box, um, you know, sort of on the shelf almost, like 
here's the board. We meet with them when we have our meetings and then, you know, we don't, we don't talk to them other than when we're you know, making asks or whatever, because I think people were a little, you know, my team a little intimidated by the board and, it, you know, it's sort of the board, right. <laughs> this, you know, kind of mythical role. And so I think, you know, really engaging them as much as we would engage staff members. And I mentioned that earlier, obviously their roles are different than staff members are, but, but engaging them in that way that, you know, makes them feel like they're actually part of my team. They're part of our broader team. They're not just kind of this board that sits over here and, and um, you know, in their special spot. Uh, I, so I think that's, that's probably the thing that I, that I, that I had to overcome and, um, you know, I think that I, I saw from my team, I even still have to kind of coach my team too, because they'll sort of, they're, they're, you know, that, that fear aspect that, um, you know, I think Mariana and Janine were mentioning too, there's, there's like a little bit of intimidation that these, these are very senior um, corporate people, right? So in many cases, some of that, you know, the fact that they are just very senior people in general can be intimidating to some of my team members. Um, because they're senior and they're also senior for our organization. So, um, you know, not, not feeling that intimidation, feeling like they're part of the team, they're here to help, they're here to support us, both financially and strategically, um, you know, that, that, that mindset just, I, I think, of integration as opposed to separation is important. I think that's such great advice in treating it as collaboration. Um, and taking fear out of it, which um, you need a good leader like yourself, Colleen, to facilitate that. Mariana, Laura, did you want to add in? something? Yeah, I, this, the fear was making me think, I actually got great feedback from my previous board chair about something I was doing like not well at all with the board. And I think it came from fear. And I was our chief operating officer before I was our CEO. So I felt like sometimes the role of the COO is to like say no to the crazy ideas of the CEO. And you feel like as a CEO, your job is to say no to crazy ideas from board members. But what um, this person told me I was doing in meetings is people would like have these big ideas and I'd be like, we are already doing this. You just don't know. Or like, that's a crazy idea and it won't work. He was like, you have to just have time to think super big with your board and it's actually good for you because it gets you really to think in the long term because you're so mired in the day to day. And so the last thing I would just say that's a mistake I've certainly made is like always going to whether something's realistic right now. And I think that sometimes we just don't feed into the really what could be possible, even if it's not gonna be possible now or even in five years, I just think we need to have those conversations because that's where you really get excited and you think about true change and true scale and systems rehauling and all of the disruption in the world, how we are a part of that. And I feel like very often, because we're like, well, but we need money now and we need to do X and Y, we just don't give enough space to some of the excitement that we could be giving space to. All ideas on the table, right? <laughs> Sure. Um, in the interest of time, I want to move to some of the questions from the audience. So Ron had a great question, uh, Colleen, how do I get board members like yours? You've shared a couple examples of some really strong, engaged board members. What advice do you have for the group for finding those type of board members for their organizations? Yeah. Um... You know, it's funny. I wish I could. I wish I could tell you that I have some magical formula for that. <laughs> I think, as you probably heard me say, I, I actually inherited most of our board members um, because I came on board after they did. But you know, I, again, I think it's similar to how you approach prospecting in many ways for donors. Um, you know, you're using your base of connections. You're using LinkedIn. Um, I think, you know, somebody had mentioned here too, you know, sort of stepping back and looking at what do you need from your board? I actually, like I said, I've been, I've been very fortunate because I have this woman who's just an incredibly robust communicator and I, you know, I, she, you know, much more so even than I am. And I love that she does that and I can like hitch my wagon to hers. And so it's like, if you need that skill set, that marketing or that communication skill set on behalf of fundraising, that would be something to look for when you're kind of looking at LinkedIn profiles, right? Um, and, uh, you know, or for example, um, you know, one of our board members that I did help to recruit and bring on with our CEO was somebody that 
um, was at an organization that frankly we wanted that um, relationship with. And, uh, and so we specifically went to that organization. We had some connections. We were looking for, you know, somebody that could help us to, you know, to both bring that organization along financially, but we knew that we also needed their help strategically because they're a major player in the industry that we're in. So, um, so we specifically kind of looked at that as, uh, as a piece of the puzzle. So I would say, you know, it's again, just as others have mentioned, stepping back, thinking about what, what do you need the most? Do you need a particular industry to be on board? Do you need some different skill sets than what you, you or your leadership team may have? Um, and, and maybe it's like just white for me, always whiteboarding, whiteboarding, all of it. Like, okay, here are the things that we have. Here are the things that, that would be awesome to have. And then now I'm going to go kind of look for the person that kind of fits that, um, that criteria. So I, I, it may be a little different than, um, than, you know, than what is traditionally done, I think, in terms of looking at um, maybe wealth capacity first. I haven't necessarily gone about it that way, but obviously that's a very important piece too. Thanks, Colleen. So we've talked about bringing the right people onto the board. Another question from the audience is, what can you do and really how do you get to the place where your nonprofit is one of the board members' top three priorities? Janine, I'd love to hear how you're approaching those conversations, again, to elevate your mission and the philanthropic priorities of your board members. Sure. Well, I think it's kind of what I said earlier. You have to set that expectation from the beginning. Um, when you're recruiting board member, if you don't communicate that directly to them, then they don't have to make you their top three um, board, you know, board roles. And so you're going to see that. And if, and if you're excited about that particular individual because of their wealth, and again, this is where I kind of mentioned, you need to make sure you're doing a full assessment and part of that assessment, making sure that you're engaging them with the mission, but also, you know, create an accountability and what's expected once they join, you know, if you're joining, this is what we ask of you. And this is what we will give you um, connection um, with our mission. So you have to make sure that you're having that talk really early on prior to them joining um, the organization. Um, and then if you have board members that don't fit that criteria and they currently are on your board, then you do need to kind of take a step back and do a reassessment of your board and sort of sort of the profiles um, that you want on the board. And one, one instance that I also have seen in the past, which has been also something to consider is um, there's a lot of expertise programmatically, um, but that's it. Right, and so they offer, they definitely offer a lot of value. So you can't take it away, but there's not a balance in the different expertise. So if you want to make sure that you're deep in fundraising, you have to have those conversations either at the beginning or reassessment and have the conversations um, with the current board. That leads uh, perfectly into the last question as we're running out of time. What do you do if you have the wrong people on the board and it's getting a little toxic? What can you do? Uh, Marianne, any advice for anyone, especially if it's someone, their role is not to overhaul the board, how can they approach that? Well, I think if your role isn't to overhaul the board, I think the question is who, whose role is that and how do you influence them? <laughs> or is there a piece of it? For example, can you help revise the onboarding materials or the job description of the expectation setting? Like if it's on the front end, if it's more about, you know, people, I, I think also what you said in the beginning, Laura, is critical, which people say, you know, our board isn't engaged, we don't have the right people, but are we also managing people correctly? And I think, um, like I mentioned before, I would have another board member say it in the next meeting. I, there is going to be one board member who you're close to, you have allies on the board, for them to say, hey, you know, we should all be making sure that we are giving before our next board meeting and let's all look at it or whatever else you need that board member to say, I would definitely use any board allies you have. They, it just lands a little bit differently when people again are saying, join us, or I think we can as a board do X and Y differently. Um, otherwise, I think you shouldn't be looking at things like, you know, your term limits and renewal process and some of those pieces, but I think um, you really have to engage your board leadership in that. And if you're not the person who is directly involved, I think the, the, the key is giving the tools, giving the research, sharing information about the best practices, so maybe that person um, can start to manage in a different way.
take myself off mute. We have one more question um, before we wrap up that I think is really interesting. How do you advise pulling the board, but also the management from veering off from activities and directions that are maybe tangential or loosely related to the mandate of the organization? Marianne, you talked about being open to ideas, but um, what if they're, they're so wild and they're so off course? How, how do you handle that? What advice do you have for the audience? Um, I think I joined ANY when it was a year old and I used to have board members call me to be like, in this spreadsheet of what we're doing on the curriculum on Saturday, should we add this topic? Uh, so I think it's definitely an evolution. I went back to the tools. I like um, like Echoing Green's Direct Impact Pledge. I know Aperio has a lot of resources out there, but what I just say all the time in onboarding and everything, I say the board's role is to be strategically engaged and operationally distant. And then I say it again and I say it as many possible. What we need your feedback on is the strategy here. And then we'll come back and talk about the operations right now. And then I think you just have to kind of cut those. Uh, and again, with your board allies who are hopefully leading the conversation for you, you know, give people a little time to start thinking about getting into some of the details and say, great, sounds like we're not going to figure that out today. But I think our key question is, do we see the most potential in this new X and Y type of program? Or do we really need to focus um, on how our brand is very different and the quality of our program? And that's what I'm hearing from the board. Like, I think you can help distill it back to strategy, um, but I do like, I think some of those phrases and some of those headlines you have to say over and over again and have other board members say. So I would just say the role of the board is to be strategically engaged and operationally distant all the time. That's a first for me. And I love that catchphrase and I hope everyone wrote that one down. We have about three minutes left. So I wanna go quickly um, around in a sentence or two, what's the biggest takeaway you wanna leave us with today? Colleen? Okay, this is, this is gonna be consistent with what I've said earlier, but I think just um, engaging your board members as individuals and really allowing their talents to shine in addition to kind of your, your vision for how they should um, you know, contribute, just allowing their individual talents to shine and support your mission in that way too, particularly when it comes to fundraising. Janine. So we, we've also heard this quite a few different ways, but it's, so, it's such an important point, which is making sure you take time to get off of the dance floor and spend more time on the balcony. So essentially, you know, we're in a day-to-day -day grind and it's hard and just being reflective. So doing so will make sure that you have different perspective on the work, how to respond to the day-to-day -day grind and the challenges that arise, but also gives you, um, you just helps you think about what's possible. And th that's really, really important to make sure you're taking time for that. Balcony, I love these catchphrases today. Mariana, what's your one key takeaway? I think, um, I think to ask a lot of questions to always just be asking questions like Colleen mentioned in your individual board management. Um, and again, to really think about the internal relationships and dynamics you have as a staff that affects how you're talking about managing and engaging with the board. Um, and then I'd say the one thing we didn't talk much about is board structure and governance in general. Like if you're very chair led or you have a really engaged executive committee or you have a committee structure, but it doesn't work. I'd say the last thing I wouldn't like, we spend a lot of time just redoing the process and redoing the committees like every few months because the committees didn't meet. And so we're gonna do the committees again. I, it's not that piece, but it is actually thinking like, how do I get a few different leaders really involved? Um, and if that happens informally, that's fine. It doesn't have to be a committee. If committees can work for you, it's great to have that peer management. And again, I, I hear all sorts of things, so there's not one right way to do it, um, but get multiple voices, ask lots of questions and be aligned with, um, with whoever is fundraising on what your roles are. Well, I want to thank everyone. I really want to um, applaud the panelists for your advice today. It was incredibly insightful, and I really hope that was helpful for the audience. And thanks to everyone listening and for joining us today. As Michelle said in the chat, the conversation was recorded, so we'll be sending out a follow-up message with Blink um, with more resources, more upcoming events. But thank you again, especially to our panelists, for all of your wonderful insights today. Have Everyone has a great afternoon.